Let us not forget everything that happens. It's by the will of Allah. Holy it's time to unite and stand, and we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or duty unthinkable. But to stand together as one. Turn into sooner followers, streaming every day. Various platforms, trust me, you'll find a way. Sooner followers, you will make it through. The fifth is awakening you. With Quran and Sunnah by your side is a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. You will make it through. The fitra is awakening you. With Quran and Sunnah on your side is a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. With Quran and Sunnah on his side, here's a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. Guys, in Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. I want to welcome everybody to the first um, class for today, tonight, which is our Akita uh, class. And uh, just to let everybody know, for yesterday we went over. Uh, we dissected, we diluted Wella Walbera uh, using the name of Allah, Ar Rashid. And I did post up uh, what you guys came up with. Uh, if you guys can see on uh, the Facebook uh, Sooner Followers group page and my profile, and even on YouTube under the community tab, I did place there. Um, uh, what everybody came up with as far as how to take the name Al Rashid and apply it to yourself to become a better, more righteous Muslim, and then how to incorporate it into our relationship with others. So that's on, I post that up for everyone because I know some of the people uh, who are new to this. A lot of people are new to my classes and they've never uh, learned the names of a law that way. Uh, many of them had asked me if I would, um, you know, post that up for them, uh, and I did. So that's posted up. And also uh, to remind everyone, uh, don't forget that tonight uh, at 9 p.m., uh, we'll be having our Articles of Belief class. Uh, so make sure that everybody is here for that too. And for now, what we're going to do is since we completed uh, chapter three of the book, uh, diluting well, I were better. And chapter three uh, discussed how to incorporate uh, brotherhood within the Muslim communities as we're living in the non Islamic states. Okay. And uh, so the, now we're moving on to chapter four because once your heart has been awakened, we talked about how the first thing that you're going to do is want to seek out people like you. That's when you're going to want to be around other Muslims. You're going to want to attach yourself to the uh, Islamic communities. You're going to try to change your uh, and find friends who can help keep you firm. Well, also in that journey, as your heart, the fitra has awakened within you, also you're going to have to change your way of thinking. We're going to have to learn to make better choices for ourselves. And this is something that the Muslims today struggle with. First of all, I want to remind everyone that Allah does not make choices for us. Do you know what I mean? There's a misconception that a lot of Muslims have. They'll say things like, well, what's the point in me repenting from my sins? Allah chose for me to go to hell. How many of you have heard people say that? 
What's the point in me changing my life? What's the point in me practicing Islam? Allah already chose me. He made me to go to hell. No, no. So in order to go about making the correct choices and decisions for ourselves as Muslims, we have to understand what free will entails. Free will entails the ability to make your own choice. Allah is not jumping in none of our bodies. He's not in any of our minds making us choose anything. We, we did the name yesterday, Ar-Rashid. Allah will guide you. He will guide you. There's an angel assigned to each and every one of our hearts. Right with that jinn, whereas the jinn whispers for us to disobey Allah, the angel whispers for us to do what's good and clean, what Allah would like for us to do. That's how Allah guides us, guys. Does everybody understand that? So don't think that Allah is making choices for you. This is incorrect. This is what the Mutazilai believe. You guys are not Mutazilai. That's the Sufi belief. No, you're not supposed to be upon that belief system, okay? Allah just knows what our choices will be. He knew what your choices would be before you were even created. So that's how he knows. He knows who's gonna be in paradise. He knows who's gonna be in hell. Not because he chose to put you there, is because he knew who of amongst us would choose to obey him and follow him and who amongst us would not. So we have to understand that. That's the first thing to understand when it comes to making choices. So now that you, we are all embarking on this journey to try to change our lifestyle to that which is pleasing to Allah, to become the strong practicing Muslims, that we should be, we're gonna have to check our choices, okay? Because life is gonna be a test. And the stronger your faith, the stronger your test, okay? Since your faith has been reawakened in your heart and you all are striving to be the best you can be as a Muslim, to be as righteous as you can be, Allah is going to send more trials to you now, more tests to you. And you're going to have to take your time and just make your choices. Don't say Allah chooses for me. No, you choose yourself. He creates the circumstance. He creates the situation, the scenario. But you make the choice. Everybody got that. A lot of people don't understand the um, istikara supplication. There's a lot of Muslims out th there that think that istikara is a work of magic or something. They think that if they want something, they're supposed to uh, make istikara and then Allah is going to jump in their body and choose for them. No, no. Istikara is just a supplication that we make. Asking Allah to give you, us the ability. You're asking Allah to give you the ability that if the choice you make, you ask, first of all, you're asking Allah to guide you. You're asking Allah to allow that angel, that angel that is assigned to every one of our hearts. When we make that istikara dua, that istikar supplication, we're asking that Allah to allow that angel to guide us to what is best for us. But the reality is sometimes we listen to the angel, but other times we listen to our jinn because we have both of these entities whispering to us. So when you perform the istikara supplication, what you're saying is, oh Allah, allow, please guide me. Please guide me to what's best for me. But should I choose what is not best for me? 
then give me the ability to walk away from it. Give me the ability to recognize that the choice was bad for me so and I can walk away from it. Don't allow me to stay in a that bad decision and end up rejecting your cotter. That's what the Istakara is. That's what we're saying. You need to read the, the English part of it. Read the, the English meaning. So a law is not jumping in your body, making any choices for you. We got the angel that's encouraging us to do what's best for us. And we got the jinn encouraging us to do what's not best for us. So you're saying, oh, Allah, if I end up listening to the jinn and taking what's not best for me, let me be able to walk away from it. Let me recognize that it's bad. When I make that mistake, let me own up to it and give me the ability to walk away from it so I don't stay in that mistake. And I end up uh, committing shirk el ashkar, which is just being discontent with my, with my situation. That's istikara. Does everybody understand what istikara is? So we have to rid ourselves in order for us to progress or to progress in this class because this chapter, chapter four, what Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid does in this chapter is he helps us to learn how to implement allegiance and disassociation when it comes to our decision-making process. But in order to do that, you have to understand as a Muslim that you make your own decisions, not a law. A law only guides. You choose. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions about that? New Shahadas. Because if you don't understand that, you're going to get lost in this chapter. Yes. Okay, Sandra, go ahead. Type your question. Elizabeth, go ahead. Because if, if you don't understand this, you're going to be lost. And Sam is asking, can you tell me why blind man kill his slave? I don't know anything about a blind man. I don't know anybody who's blind. So Sam, I don't know if you got the right website or not. I don't know anything about blind people. And I don't have any slaves. I don't know nothing about no slave. You know, the slave movement is over with in America. Oh, yeah. I was born during the civil rights time in 1961. So I wasn't here for the slavery period. So I can't tell you nothing about no slaves. So I think you got the wrong website. This is an Islamic website. We're learning Islam. We're not here to talk about blind people or slaves. Thank you. Keep it moving. Go ahead, Sandra. All right. Uh, uh, and by the way, do I have any moderators logged in on YouTube? If so, please deal with that. Okay, so exactly, uh, Sandra, this is something that you're going to have to understand. Exactly. Allah does not make the choice for you. You choose. That's what free will is. Remember when we began this journey? We began this journey. We talked about how after Allah created Adam, he ran his hand across Adam's back. And he said, and that's when all our souls appear. All of our souls appeared. Okay. And that's when Allah gathered all of us at Mount Arafat. And we all testify to la ilaha illallah. OK, and then Allah offered us the ability to make our own choices and own decisions. We accepted it. And that's when he said, so you will make your own choices, your own decisions in life. I may guide you. 
I will send messengers to you to remind you of what your choices should be. But as far as choosing for us, no, Allah does not do that. We choose for ourselves. Does everybody understand? So he may, the, the, through that angel, through that angel that's assigned to our heart, the angel sends us good inspirations from Allah. That's the job of that angel. The job of that angel is to uh, inspire you. Just like the job of that jinn is to uh, get you to disobey Allah. They're fighting each other all the time. Sometimes we listen to that angel. Sometimes we listen to that jinn. Sometimes we make good choices, good decisions, because we listen to that angel. But oftentimes we make bad ones, because oftentimes we listen to the jinn. Because remember, our soul is criminal by nature. Yes. So now do you have it? Okay, good. What about you, Elizabeth? Is it okay? You understand? Let me know. Okay, good job. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Okay, so we have to understand those two points. Those two points right there. And now, having explained those two uh, precipices to you, let's now move on to uh, the chapter for today. And uh, I did post up on YouTube and um, the internet uh, what pages that we would be dealing with today. Let me put this down and the PowerPoint down. Hold on. Um, so I can put the PowerPoint up. Yeah, let me. Yeah, I'm gonna do this now. Hold on. Yeah, that's the Sufi, the Mutazala. They the ones that. That's where you heard that stuff from. You know, Allah doesn't make choices for us. He doesn't jump in our bodies and do that. You know, that's no. We make our own choices. He just guides us. He will guide us. Have that angel remind us of what our purpose is that angel will remind us of what what will happen if we make the wrong choice but you know we decide to listen to the angel or listen to the gym and that goes hand in hand with what we talked about the other day sister bethany remember the other day we talked about how um um uh on the day of judgment iblis will have his grandstand he will stand before everybody and say, do not blame me. I didn't make you do anything. I didn't have the power to make you do the things you did. You chose, you made the choice to listen to me. All I can do was whisper to you. And that's the same thing with the angel that's assigned to us. And that's the same thing Allah will say, you know, subhanAllah, Allah say, I sent you messengers. I sent you my book. I sent you great role models from those companions. And I even assigned an angel to your heart. And through all of this, I guided you to what was right. I guided you to what was truthful, but you still made the choice to disobey me. Y'all get it? For the people in Zoom, is this clear? Because half of y'all don't understand this either. Do Is this clear in Zoom? Yes. Okay, so again, don't the devil didn't make you do nothing. Shaitan didn't make you do anything and neither did Allah. They just whispered a law through that had that angel take care of that. And Shaitan had his denizen, the jinn. So blame yourself. We all will stand before a law on a day of judgment. We can't blame no one, no one for our choices. And when you're re, if you're re, lucky or fortunate enough to be rewarded with paradise, we will thank a law for that. We will thank Allah for that. And you know what Allah will say? Subhanallah. You did it yourself. 
You did it yourself by uh, obeying me. You chose. You chose me over Iblis. You chose me over your own desires. You chose to obey me over your friend, your relatives, your family. So this is what you deserve. Everybody understand? That's what Allah will say. So this is what we deserve. So that's what he'll say. You earned it. Allah will tell in all of us, whoever is fortunate enough to enter into paradise, Allah will say to us, this is what you deserved. This is what you earned because you listened to my guidance. You chose to follow and obey me. The choice is ours. Everybody understand that? All right. I'm trying to break that down in plain English. A lot of the brothers have a hard time explaining that because their English is not good or the person that speaks English, but he's just not educated about the Carter because he doesn't understand it himself. Like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, most of our nation will not understand the Carter. Most of our nation will not understand this. And it's, it's the reality. That's why it's not explained to you guys properly. All right. So let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen. See, my phone is starting to go crazy. Oh, let me, oh, first, let me do this. Let me log on here. Uh, okay, stop this. Okay. And let me go to the Zoom people first. Wait a minute. Let me, where's the PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm not going to give you guys a quiz tonight because uh, this stuff is important. What I'm going to go over today with you guys, I want y'all to pay attention and ask me questions afterwards. So no quiz tonight, but I should have not have told you because you will listen now. A lot of y'all get to cooking and cleaning and I know they do in my Zoom room. They don't pay me no attention. That's why they can't answer half the questions here. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be in Zoom. I'm sorry. I'm sitting here. Get ready to share it to you guys. Let me do them first. Wait a minute. Let's go back to Zoom. Okay. Yeah, y'all wake up in that Zoom room and pay attention. Seriously. Okay. And let me come to everybody here. Yeah, here we go. There we go. Inshallah, you guys can see my screen. Okay, and I'm going to make it larger. And let me open. These people were texting me, and whatever they did, they messed up my phone with their text, whereas um, I can't see. I had it opened up to see on Facebook. Hold on, let me get it back open on Facebook so I can see what they're typing. Oh, God. Okay, here we go. This is Facebook. Okay, I'm trying to keep my eye on Facebook. Okay, let's share, the, uh, make the screen larger. Okay, inshallah. Yeah, this is the book. And these are the, we're starting beginning uh, chapter four. This is pages 178 through 181. And this chapter of uh, Sheikh Karim Abouze focuses on uh, how to navigate allegiance and disassociation when it comes to our uh, making choices in life or our decision making in life. And today what we're going to do is speak about uh, the impact of our past influences. You know, we talked during Ramadan about how important it is for each and every one of us to hold ourselves accountable. And I hope you guys are still doing what I suggested we do. Remember during Ramadan, I said every night before you go to sleep, after you put the kids to bed and whatever, take some me time and think about your day. Review everything that you did from the time you woke up until that moment and ask yourself, you know, did, did I make good choices? Were the decisions I made good? 
and the deeds, the deeds I did, did I do them for a law or did I do them for some other reason or some other person? So that way, by holding yourselves accountable each night, you can wake up in the morning and make corrections. You can go in and, and mend whatever fences you broke. If you realize you were too rough with your children, you can apologize in the morning at breakfast. If you were not understanding your husband, you can let him know later. You know, if you did a, a something bad at the job, you hurt an employee's feelings or a co-worker's feelings, you can amend that fence. So again, we should always hold ourselves accountable for the things we do, our actions and our words each day. And also when we're changing our life, because many of you are Muslims, but you weren't practicing the religion. I have a lot of people listening to me who have been Muslim for years. Many of you were born Muslim, but you never took Islam seriously. But Alhamdulillah, you started taking it seriously during Ramadan. And your fitra has been awakened by coming to my classes. So now you want to continue with the good deeds. Like Sister Sandra said, Sandra quit smoking. She quit, kicked the habit during the month of Ramadan. She doesn't want to go back to smoking ever. So it's important for us to understand we, as Muslims, we don't live in the past. Islam doesn't teach us to live in the past. Whatever we did in the past, we leave it there and look to the future and keep moving. Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever we repent from our sins, the angels erase it off the books. It's as if the sin never happened. So whatever happened in the past, we leave it there. But the only thing we do walk away with from the past is understanding of its impact. Y'all understand that? It's important to understand the impact of past influences, to understand the impact of whatever the trial was and learn from it. Because by understanding the impact of what happened in the past, by understanding the impact of what occurred or its influences, this is when you cannot fall. You can assure that you don't fall into the same predicament again. Does everybody follow me with this? That's why you are hear, hear me always saying, I don't care about no conversion stories. There's a lot of Muslims that really like to hear conversion stories. Why? Who cares? There's people that's been Muslim all their life and they've been traveling around the world with their conversion story. They haven't made no growth. Everybody got a story. Who cares? You know, what have you learned from your story? What have you learned that you can put forth for tomorrow to not make the same mistakes again? So that's why I tell you guys, let whatever happened in the past be the past. Learn from it and keep it moving. So this is what this chapter is going to focus on. Let's look at the first uh, uh, pet part here. When it comes to personal decision making, we have to understand it's going to always be a challenge for us. Because whatever the choice is that we make, it will impact our spirituality. And being that most of us, our souls have been ignited, we're going to face choices that are going to require us to transition from one lifestyle to another. You want to better your situation. A lot of you sisters have gone through divorce. Your divorces have been final now. The edat period, the waiting period is over. Okay, so now you have to transition from it. 
You got to leave that lifestyle, the lifestyle of a married woman to now you're, you're growing into the lifestyle of a single woman. And not only do we transition from one lifestyle to another, but we have to also change our social circles too. For you sisters who are newly divorced, you're going to find out that a lot of the women that used to be your friends when you were married, they're not going to be your friends now because you represent a threat to them. And this is the reality. The brothers are not going to tell you this, but I can because I'm a woman and I've been through that. I'm a threat to most women. That's why I only have two friends in my life, Aisha and Latifah. Everybody else look at me as a threat, and I don't know why, because I don't want a man, Supana Allah. So you're going to have to navigate and change your social circles too. For those of you who used to smoke, like Sandra, now you can't go in environments or social settings where the people are smoking now, okay? Previously ingrained habits that led to your disobedience of a law, you're going to have to get rid of, let go of now. All of this comes with the igniting of the fitra or the awakening of the fitra within the heart. And so this chapter is going to focus on how to evolve through this. In recognition of the importance of what a law likes and what a law dislikes. Everybody understand that? So, el wella, well better. What does that mean in English? El wella refers to having loyalty and allegiance to a law, to the religion, to the prophet, to the Muslims. And well better refers to disassociating myself from anything that comes between that, any of that. So this becomes our compass of for morality. Since our soul has been awakened, since our soul has been ignited. So we have to uh, use our allegiance and disassociation as the compass for it and allow that allegiance and disassociation to direct us towards choices that are in harmony with what a law likes with what a law's religion entails and with what our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam represented everybody understand that does everyone understand that so this is why I really enjoy this chapter too now, because now we're going to get into learning how to make better choices for ourselves. All right. So let's look at the past influences. Like I said, we don't sit there and harbor on the past. Like I had to explain to one of the sisters here, uh, one of the new Shahadas uh, had been abused sexually. Okay, she was sexually molested most all of her life. And I'm going to do a special on this because this is a big problem. She said she was molested by her uncles, molested by uh, uh, her neighbor, molested by a teacher. So her past was a past of sexual abuse, sexual molestation. And she said it's something that she, before Ramadan, she shared that with me and said it's something that she is struggling with. And like I told her, I said, you got to let it go. You got to let it go. And she asked me, Sister Layla, how can I let it go? I was violated by people who I trusted. And she went on this tangent about what all she went through with her uncle and all this. And when she was her teachers and when she was done, I said, are you done? She said, yes. I said, you're still living, right? I said, you're here, right? Yes. I said, you survived it, didn't you? Yes. 
I said, now tell me, what did you learn from it? What did you learn from all that you've shared with me for the past two hours? She said, well, I know that, you know, I'll never, if I ever have any kids, I'll never just leave my children with anybody because they are relative. I said, good, write that down. She said, what? I said, write it down. And then she said, and I also learned that I would never, ever, ever allow any of my ch daughters, you know, to go to after school uh, events to be one on one with a teacher. And I'm not there. I said, write it down. She did. And, I, and as she started rambling on and on about what she would never do, I said, now I want you to look at what you've written. She had six pages, six pages of things she'd written down. I said, I want you to put at the top of that page, lessons learned. Lessons learned from my past. I said, take those lessons that you learned, read them off, put them in your heart and tear the page up. And she did. I said, so now it's over. It's over. I said, you survived. It's over. You made it through all that. You've walked away with six pages worth of lessons learned that will make you a better mother, a better parent to your children, where you would never put your children in harm's way like your parents did you. So keep it moving. Don't think about it no more. I said, put S on your forehead for survivor. I told her, you're a survivor. You a survivor. She started laughing, of course. I said, and don't think about the past no more. Let it go. It's over. It's done. And mashallah, she's still here. And she's in our Zoom room. She comes all the time. And she's no problem. So past influences. We don't live in the past, but it's important for us to analyze the factors that contributed to either the bad things that happened to us and also the factors that contributed to the good things because we can attain valuable insights from this, guys. This will help us to transform. This will help us to embrace Islam. This will help us to embrace allegiance and disassociation in our future personal choices. Like she said, she's going to make a good mother, inshallah, because she knows what to not do, what type of situation to not put her children in. So past influences are very important, guys, when it comes to decision making. OK. So. Oftentimes, for many of us, we have to explore our childhood, not live in it. But like I had her do that day when she called me before Ramadan, we was on the phone all night. I had to go over all her terrible pity party experiences. When we explore the role of parental neglect, because that's the problem with a lot of us. A lot of you were born Muslim. I have a lot of Bantus here, people from the African countries. They were born Muslims. Their families were Muslim, but you never practiced or you never took Islam seriously. Why? because of your parents. Your parents didn't do their job during the formulative years. And this is why I am always uh, reminding the sisters here, you guys know I am all about Islam. I am a woman of the Sunnah, a woman of the Sunnah. My role model is Aisha, ready Allahu anha, and all those female companions. And I'll tell you sisters, I know what my rights are as a woman. I know that I am not oppressed. I am not deprived or depraved. My Lord raised me up 
and gave me rights that no other woman ever had before. I have the right to be beautiful. I have the right to dress nicely. I have a right to the right to take pride in my appearance out the house and in the house. But also I know are the children come first. That is your job as a woman. If you have children, that's your priority because you play a great role in the formative years of those children's life. Like when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Umar ready Allahu anha uh, uh, trying to take his son from his ex-wife. And the woman screamed and, and that ran to the prophet and said, who's most deserving of the child? The prophet said, you are, because these are the formulative years of his life. We've abandoned that today. A lot of you women are into working and making money. That's why I'm so proud of my students here. My students here, you know, they work, but like, like Habiba, she works from home. So she can monitor her children and raise them like Fan May or like Shamza. She's a nurse, but she's a nurse that works from home. She manages her schedule where she can be there for her children. So again, guys, the influence of the parents and family during the formative years play a significant role. And molding the beliefs and behaviors of each and every one of us. And we wonder why our children grow up and they apostate when they reach the age of puberty. It's because we didn't give them the nourishment that they needed to, to awaken their fitra when they were young. Subhana Allah. So, you know, past influences are good for that reason. We can look at the past and recognize what factors contributed to me having to change myself. A lot of you brothers were born and raised Muslim, but you don't pray. I bet you your father didn't enforce for you to go to the mosque for Juma, did he? I bet your parents put more emphasis on your schooling and football than they did Juma prayer and classes at the mosque. So when we sit back and evaluate and see what we need to work on about ourselves, that's the role the past plays. We look to see what the past influences of good and the past influences of evil were in our lives so we cannot make those mistakes or rid them, rid ourselves of them. And also environment. Environment is important too. Remember guys, the society and culture can play a big role in our choices and beliefs. Like the brother, uh, another one of our new Shahadas, he lived in Miami, Florida. And then, by the way, he moved. I'm so proud of you. He said he converted to Islam. He's from Miami. You know, he's from the Miami scene. He said, but Sister Layla, I can't maintain my dean down here. He said, you know, you ain't never been to Miami. Yeah, we got alligators. He say, but the women walk around with their underwear on. They walk around with a bra on and a pair of drawers and they on skates. I said, skates? Yeah, they roller skate in their uh, underwear. He said, how's a man, how's a brother supposed to maintain his taqwa? I said that you need to move, Aki. You need to move someplace else from Miami. I said, I, I didn't know all that was going on down there. He said, yeah, you should travel. He said, the men walk around naked too. He said, it's hot here. I said, and you got to move someplace where you ain't exposed to all that. So the culture, the society, and by the way, this brother's Cuban. He said, his culture is a culture of music. He said, the Cubans love to party. They love to get drunk. They love to have sex. 
They love to do all that. I said that you need to change your environment because society and culture can play a great role uh, and influence in our choices and beliefs. And mashallah, he moved away. He moved to Chicago. Lord, he went from Miami to Chicago, Illinois. He's here now. He's in Chicago, he said. So if the environment fosters a culture of disobedience or sin, then it could have contributed to the, as to why your fitra was not awakened. It will contribute as to whether or not you practice your religion correctly or not. So again, guys, environment, parental guidance, and any other factors like that, they play a great role in our decision making. And also we have to examine the people, the people that we associate with too. Okay, like Sister Sandra, she just kicked the habit. She's no longer a smoker since Ramadan, Alhamdulillah. So she's got to surround herself with people who don't smoke. She can't go around those Muslim women that smoke cigarettes or those non-Muslims that smoke. Okay? Her soul has been awakened. So she cannot associate with people who contradict that awakening. So the company that we keep is very important. I've got a couple of new sisters that's been coming to the Zoom room since Ramadan. And they say how much they love it because they used to go to the mosque. But the mosques are filled with so much fitna nowadays. You know, so much fitna. So these sisters were talking about how they feel such so good just hanging out with us in the Zoom room. That's why I keep that Zoom room open 24 hours because you want to be able to talk and interact with other Muslims who are like-minded like yourself. And sometimes you can't find that at the mosque. A lot of women go to the mosque just to get into the business of others or to look for a man. And I just heard looking for a woman too. I heard that these gay bladed mosques, that's another thing. We're going to talk about that for one of my Ask Sister Layla live shows. These uh, gay bladed mosques are popping up everywhere. Can y'all believe that? We got some more gay bladed mosques. Okay. So again, the influence of the people whose company uh, we seek, you know, the ones we sought in the past, we may have to change to new people. And also, finally, guys, we have to maintain Islamic knowledge. Remember, seeking knowledge of Islam is an obligation upon each and every one of us as Muslims. A lot of your fitra was awakened through coming to my classes during Ramadan. Do you think uh, if you stop that it's going to stay awakened? No. You have to seek knowledge of the religion on a, a consistent basis and surround yourself with people who are practicing and try to stick to a faith-centered environment. Like I told the sisters here on my Zoom room, this Zoom room is your faith-centered environment. As Muslim women, we get more blessings at home anyway. You're sitting here uh, hanging it, kicking it out with your sisters. In the Zoom room, this is your faith-centered environment. So all of these things will help us to transform into better people. And again, I started my lecture off today uh, speaking about how each and every one of us has an angel and a jinn assigned to our heart. That angel will inspire you to obey Allah. Whereas that jinn will inspire you to disobey him. They both whisper. They both whisper through the heart. We're going to have to learn to overcome the whispers of that jinn. Because in the decision-making journey towards showing allegiance to Allah and his religion and disassociating from that which opposes it, 
comes many challenges. And remember, whenever our faith increases, that's when Allah will send even stronger tests your way. So you're going to find yourself having to make choices and decisions in life that you never made before since Ramadan has ended. Okay. And remember, guys, uh, Shaitan has allies, not just from the jinn, but there are allies amongst mankind, too. There are a lot of human Shaitans that we come in contact with. For example, those co-workers that you work with who are sitting there telling you that you're uh, going to hell because you embarked upon this religion and they're calling your way of life a terroristic way of life. Those people are, uh, are the devils amongst uh, the humans. So you have to stay away from them. And then we got Muslims too who are weak and not practicing. They may be angry to see that you are practicing. So they're going to call you a terrorist. They're going to call you a fanatic. So you're going to have to distance yourself from them too. So listen to this hadith uh, uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, Shaitan lays in wait for the son of Adam. He sits on the path of Islam and he says, you will convert to Islam and then you will abandon it. And you will, and, and you will, you will abandon your religion and you're going to abandon the religion of your forefathers for this way of life. And then he'll sit on the path again and say, now that you Muslim, you're talking about moving. You're going to move to a different city, a different part of the world so you can practice. And then when you struggle to try to please the law, Shaitan will come to you and say, you mean to tell me you're going to fight and get killed. You're going to give up your desires, your wants, your, your happiness in this world for what you think is going to be happiness for you in the hereafter. So this hadith, and I'm rewording it to try to make it more clear to you. This hadith shows how every day of our life, whenever we grow closer to Allah, Shaitan, your personal jinn, and his allies is going to do everything to stand in the way of us getting or maintaining that closest with Allah. Okay? Shaitan will dissuade you from taking the right path and following the law's commands. He will try to put doubt, fear, and hesitation in your heart, okay? He will cause you to question your decisions and try to lure you away from the truth. Remember, he will make the truth appear to be falsehood and he will make the falsehood appear to be truth. He'll cause you to focus on things that are not important. Like, for example, you come to this website. You don't know that as a Muslim woman, Allah commands us to be loud in our voices publicly, to be intimidating in our voices publicly. Your jinn knows that you don't know that. So he'll tell you to focus on my voice and wow, she talks loud. She doesn't sound like the women that you've been with all your life. And instead of you saying, yeah, I shouldn't have been with those women. Where did those women lead me? Those women are the women that led me to the, to, down the path to sin with their voices. But instead of you thinking that way, you're going to fall for that. So that's just an example as to how Shaitan will try to lure us away from the truth and try to get us to go back to the lifestyle we had before we embarked upon practicing the truth. He'll try to get you to stay in Miami. He'll try to get you to stay around the naked women. He'll try to get you to stay around your, your friends uh, who you grew up with because, hey, it's your culture. These your people, man. You from Cuba. This is Cuba. 
We going to stay here and party like it's 1999. It's a celebration. He'll try to dissuade you from leaving your familiar surrounding to seek a new life so you can be more devoted to Allah. And again, he'll try to scare you away. Scare you away from what's good and clean for you. So again, guys, I want y'all to understand decision-making. This is why I was telling you guys during Ramadan, every one of us, myself included, we need to make some time at night to hold ourselves accountable by thinking about the choices we made during the day, the decisions we made, the actions we embarked upon. Were they done the way Allah commanded? Were they done for his sake? Or did I do them for reasons other than he? Did I violate his religion when I made those choices? By doing this, guys, you can hold firm to the truth. And your soul, your soul can stay awakened. And then we can assure that whatever choices we made were good. Everybody understand that? So again, the power of self-awareness that helps to keep our soul strong. It helps to keep the fitra burning within our heart. And being around people who can encourage us to hold on to the rope of this line. That will also help us in our decision making. Seeking knowledge on a red contact with the people and knowledge. Like you guys are here at this website with me, Jamali, Sheikh Morsi, and the rest of us here. This is how, you know, we can embark upon the road that will end up being successful in the long run for us, okay? So I'm gonna stop right here again, decision-making. And this was just the introduction. Uh, the rest of this chapter, we're gonna go into training sessions. Uh, what Kareem Abuze does is uh, he breaks it down different scenarios.